Miss Anscombe was famously fearless in challenging ill-conceived fashions of the age. We think immediately of her critiques of the atomic bombing on Japan, the mass killings by abortion, the sexual revolution and sloppy thinking in philosophy, especially moral philosophy. She was relentless in pursuing the truth, open to engaging interlocutors and generous in contributing her wisdom to the wider society. I had the privilege of meeting her on several occasions and like many people was both inspired by her deep faith and more than a little intimidated by her formidable intellect. May this centre that now bears her name long continue to inspire and intimidate after that fashion. As the 30th Olympiad of the modern era reached its pyrotechnical finale, Britons were rightly proud. The band performing were The Who, and the song, My Generation, a sort of anthem for modern Britain as much as for the athletes. Composed in 1965 by the 20-year-old Pete Townsend, My Generation is one of The Who's most recognisable songs. Now, fear not, I'm not going to perform it tonight <laughs> myself. I lack the appropriate instrumental backing and smoke machines. <laughs> but the song does offer one of the most memorable lines in rock history. I hope I die before I get old. When sneered in Pete's distinctively frustrated stutter, these words were symbolic of an attitude that marked his generation and from which Western culture is yet to recover. So my paper begins with a few thoughts on the metaphysics of elderliness. I'll then address the current crisis in healthcare provision and the increasingly common proposal that healthcare be rationed away from those who've already had a fair innings towards those who are younger. I'll conclude with some thoughts on the need to re-establish the covenant between the generations in healthcare in the ageing West. Who are the elderly? When still an auxiliary bishop in Sydney, I was charged with organising fraternal activities for the younger clergy. Younger clergy were defined as those ordained after Bishop Anthony. <laughs> that line moved inexorably and became increasingly comical. So I was translated to another diocese and replaced by a younger auxiliary. <laughs> Defining the elderly is equally complex. Janet Roebuck in When Does Old Age Begin? The Evolution of the English Definition puts it at 50, which I now think the prime of life. <laughs> Many countries have adopted 65 as the statutory retirement age, a point first chosen by Bismarck for the cynical reason that most working class men were dead by then and so would not draw the social security he was supposedly offering. The Catholic Church, never one to follow the Iron Chancellor, retires its priests and bishops at 75, its voting cardinals at 80, but popes can still be going strong at 85. Grace of state, or is it celibacy, apparently slows the ageing of the Catholic clergy. <laughs> we might be tempted to say it's all relative, or you're only as old as. But I do think there is something in the idea of the elderly, even if the group has fuzzy edges. We need some definition if we are to give the elderly particular attention, even privileges. One starting point is the natural or species typical lifespan. The lifespan of most of us in the absence of specific mortal diseases and fatal accidents. There does seem to come a stage beyond which most people would not feel cheated were they to die sooner rather than later, which is not to say they get on to die. 
Likewise, it does seem to be a juncture at which we would not judge someone else's death as premature. We might still grieve their passing, but not with the special grief associated with untimely deaths. At some point then, people are thought to have had a fair innings, to use the English and Commonwealth idiom. At such a stage, a virtuous person might think it appropriate to prepare himself and others for his death, and might no longer apply as much effort to postponing it. Just when that is, is partly a matter of traditional expectations. Psalm 90 offers three score years and ten, or four score for those who are strong, and partly a matter of present day averages. It will be part biological, part environmental, part cultural. Whatever the age at which people are expected to die sooner rather than later, the stage immediately preceding it might be called old age, and its inhabitants the elderly or seniors. If life is divided into youth, middle age and old age, it might be roughly the last third. Or it might be seen as the stage after retirement from full-time work. Once people have entered that phase of life, they are expected to engage in different projects, might be honoured as elders, and might warrant assistance of various sorts, pensions, appropriate housing, transport, concessions, spiritual care, and so on. Healthcare obviously comes in here, and there is a whole specialty of gerontology aimed at this phase of life and its particular challenges. Recently I read a complaint that young people today are addicted to luxury, have terrible manners, contempt for authority and no respect for elders. They don't stand for their teachers, they contradict their parents, they chatter endlessly and gobble their food. The complaint is of course attributed to Socrates. <laughs> and so has already been made four centuries before Christ. Pete Townsend's generation was not the first to know the generation gap, even if it was unusual in so publicly glorying in it. But the Socratic idea of repeated down the centuries was that such gaps must be bridged, principally by the recognition that elders have a proper authority, deserving of respect, and that the young should be ready to be led and taught by them. Thus, the longest paragraph of the Hippocratic Oath is about reverence for teachers and for passing on the art of medicine. Without respect of elders, the thought goes, you cannot have effective leadership or transmission of wisdom. You cannot have education. <coughs> the Christian story begins, of course, not with an ancient philosophy, but with God taking flesh of a young woman as an embryo and newborn babe. Yet that same beginning is framed by older people, Zechariah and Elizabeth, Simeon and Anna, and of course Joseph. And their role is not only to close the Old Testament, but to herald the new. Theirs is not just the rich treasury of Israel's history and promises, but also the present task of contemplating that patrimony and interceding for the future. The ancient Anna haunts the, haunts the temple with constant prayer, as so many elderly people before and since, retired from previous work to engage in preparing themselves and all humanity for eternity. Thus the Gospels, while delighting in children and young people, do not idolise youthful physique as the ancient Greeks did nor write off elderly spirit, as our contemporaries do. Christian pietas, as articulated by St Thomas Aquinas, begins with the thought that God is owed our reverence and gratitude, and that this is not for our sake, but his, sorry, for his sake, but ours. Fix that one. 
In the great bioethical encyclical Evangelium Vitae, Blessed John Paul II built upon this tradition in calling for a climate of mutual interaction and enriching communication between the different age groups. To modern ears, piety often sounds like old ladies at their devotions, whereas the Christian thought is that it's about right relations, especially with the God who is the source of our being and all we have. If old ladies are good at that, it's greatly to their credit. But for Aquinas, young men needed every bit as much if they are to be saved and communities need it if they are to function well. We have all at some time seen some wonder, such as the Milky Way, our own newborn baby, or the Triduum ceremonies of Blackfriars, and experienced open-mouthed awe, wonder, humility, delight in the goodness and beauty and sheer undeserved gift of it. That emotion and instinct and the response of reverence and thanksgiving is at the heart of pietas, of many social relations and of all true religion. Pietas, on Aquinas' account, extends then from God as source of all being to those who mediate that being to us. Those giants upon whose shoulders we stand, who built our church and country and make us heirs to so much that is good in our institutions, traditions, values and beliefs. The long genealogy of those who passed on life and love and truth and beauty to us saints, ancestors, countrymen, above all, perhaps, our parents and grandparents. Key to piety is deep respect for that which we have received and from whom. Without such a sense, we will fail not only to honour father and mother as the Decalogue commands, but our history and context, and so we will lack perspective and vision for the future. So when John Paul called for a climate of mutual interaction and enriching communication between the generations, he was asking young people and middle-aged people to offer their elders that acceptance, reverence, solidarity and love which they received from those older people <coughs> when they were children and to recognise the rich treasury of experiences that those older people have acquired over the years and that make them sources of wisdom and witnesses of hope and love. Denied such pious reverence and humble docility, John Paul feared, the elderly will increasingly be abandoned as useless burdens and offered only the euthanasist's handbook. In Janicek's 1923 opera, The Macropolis Affair, an esteemed alchemist, Hieronymus Macropolis, concocts an elixir of youth for his daughter Amelia, whose subsequent long life allowed her to become one of the greatest sinners of all time. Around this, Bernard Williams wove his classic article on why it's wrong to aspire to endless mortal life. He argued that a human being who will always be there and whose condition can get no worse, has no motivation for friendship, education, or striving. Without vulnerabilities, men cannot demonstrate excellences. Much of life only makes sense in a form in which we rise and fall, start and finish. The shape and curve of life is given by the inevitability of death and of old age, if we are lucky. Old age, Williams concluded, has its own particular value, and the whole of life can't be understood without a conception of old age, <coughs> its meaning and value. Martha Nussbaum is one of several recent philosophers reflecting upon the emotions. In her neo-stoic cognitive evaluative account, emotions are a kind of intelligence indispensable for our ethical lives. 
It's because of our vulnerability, our susceptibility to sickness, aging, and eventual dying, that we have the characteristically human emotions of grief, compassion, and love, she says. Emotions that present us with opportunities to care for each other in ways that express genuine altruism. From very different angles, Stanley Howarth and Alistair McIntyre have likewise drawn attention to the defining experiences of vulnerability and dependence in human life, especially at the beginning and the end, but often in between as well. Once again, without ageing and the elderly, we cannot make sense of human life. We could say many more things about the metaphysics of elderliness. My main point here is, being senior is not just being past your use by date, or a useless burden. It's not even principally about being a babysitter for grandchildren, or a consumer of health care, geriatric cruises, and funeral services. Rather, I suggest, without ageing and the elderly, we will lose our sense of the shape and meaning of life, the emotions proper to it, education for living it, tradition for carrying it forward, and God for appreciating The primary purposes of healthcare are to save lives in peril, to prevent, cure, or slow the course of disease to alleviate symptoms and to care in the meantime. But healthcare also serves to articulate some other important social values. There are good reasons to think that contemporary Western societies undervalue their older members. While the young, productive and physically perfect are idolised, ageing is often treated as shameful. It's signs to be warded off by medical, sartorial, cosmic, cosmetic artistry, and once undeniable as warranting exclusion from various contexts. Examples of neglect and elder abuse are countless in the British tabloids. But one way societies demonstrate they still value older people is pro by providing dignified health and aged care. Such care expresses fundamental values such as equal respect for persons, the sanctity of life, and the rescue imperative, concern for the weak and suffering, and reverence for elders. The quality of health and aged care provision to the elderly speaks volumes of the quality of pietas, and thus of justice and mercy in a particular community. Which brings me to part three, arguments for and against age rationing. If the London Olympics closed with the antiphon, I hope I die before I get old, they opened with a rather different tune. A highly praised spectacle playing to a billion people worldwide chronicled the rise of modern Britain. An agricultural ideal was rolled up to make way for satanic mills, suffragettes, 007, Mr Bean, Lord Valdemort, and multiple Mary Poppinses. Christianity was absent from this account, and royalty relegated to entertainment. But some things are still sacred. The National Health Service, according to Nigel Lawson, is the closest thing the English have to a religion. <laughs> so hundreds of dancing doctors and nurses, with 320 children bouncing up and down on hospital beds, delivered an ext extended sequence culminating with the letters N-A-S. <coughs> the director, Danny Boyle, explained, everyone is aware of how important the NHS is to everybody in this country. One of the core values of our society is that it doesn't matter who you are, you will get treated the same in terms of health care. Maybe. <laughs> Though rock singers never really retire, sometimes you might wish they would, Townsend's generation of baby boomers are doing just that, are living longer 
and expect access to a much more expensive high-tech care than was on offer when they started seeing Who will provide it? There were a hundred centenarians in Britain a century ago when the monarchs started sending telegrams. Nowadays, there are 10,000 plus warranting a card. Eventually, it will have to be royal e-cards, as a quarter of all babies born this year are expected to live beyond 100. By then, there may be only one working adult for each person pre or post work. Funding the pensions, NHS, and care of the elderly, as well as the upkeep and education of the young. Already, the UK Department of Health reports that around 45% of NHS hospital and community health expenditure goes to those over 65, though they are only 16% of the population. As their numbers rise, both proportionately and in absolute terms, the strain on the NHS will also. Across the sea, Medicare for the over 65s will jump from the current 46 million beneficiaries to 79 million by 2030, with cost per person also doubling in the same period. Something, people are saying, has to give. Calling it the intergenerational fairness agenda, some commentators now openly ask whether younger people should be expected to fund benefits for older ones. In The Pinch, how the baby boomers took their children's future and why they should give it back, David Willits speaks for the increasingly common idea that the over 65s are a burden on the young and their expectations of endless pensions, health and aged care must be curtailed. Daniel Knowles declared in The Spectator earlier this year that the baby boomer generation is the most cosseted, untouchable, powerful generation in our history, and that they are living longer than was envisaged and costing too much, and that younger people cannot be expected to keep them in the style to which they've become accustomed. The elderly should pay their fair share themselves and draw less upon the public purse. Increasingly, in the NHS scene, from the, uh, interestingly, in the NHS scene from the London Olympic Opera, all the patients were children. Allocating healthcare on the basis of age, what I call hereafter age rationing, is the policy of excluding persons from a certain age onwards from certain treatments, scaling back care as they get older or preferring the young when there is competition for some intervention. <laughs> this already goes on, directly or indirectly, in many countries. In many countries, older people have less medical contact than their condition warrants, and ageism on the part of health workers is well documented. When I was researching here two decades ago, it was clear that older renal patients who would receive dialysis in other countries were routinely denied it in Britain. The same was true in cardiac, stroke, cancer and intensive care, with older patients being told nothing more can be done for you. Despite public unease with age discrimination, health professionals and bureaucrats contained costs by age rationing. Behind this unspoken compact seem to be the idea that the oldies have already had a fair innings and so should not expect as much help. The National Service Framework for Older People of 2001 was supposed to end NHS age rationing. A subsequent review by the King's Fund found age discrimination endemic in the NHS. Enthusiasm for do not resuscitate orders and advanced care planning for the elderly may also reflect this. A 2008 survey found most gerontologists believe the NHS is institutionally ageist and fear how, how they'll be treated when they get old. The BMA insisted that this is a society-wide problem, not just in healthcare. The government again promised to fix it. 
2010, it passed the Equality Act and the NHS Constitution, both of which forbid age discrimination. Earlier this year, Home Secretary Theresa May announced that from October 2012, it will be illegal to withhold help on the basis of age. That's from this month. Presumably the reason government has to keep saying this is that age discrimination continues. A series of departmental reviews in 2009 found overwhelming evidence of substandard care of the elderly with heart disease, stroke, depression, diabetes, eye or ear problems, hypertension, arthritis, osteoporosis, falls, pain and incontinence. If I'm invited back in 20 years' time to review the situation for a third time, it may well, I may well find that for all the protestations and policies, things haven't much changed in this regard. They certainly haven't in the past 20 years. If anything, maybe they've got worse. The clinical case for age rationing. It's often difficult to untangle people's reasons for favouring age rationing. Clinical, economic and philosophical rationales are often intertwined, as well as a sense of emergency, prejudice towards the elderly and personal fear of ageing. The clinical rationale is that older people receive little or no benefit or are less likely to benefit from particular treatments than younger people. Age is thus a useful new rule of thumb for appropriateness of an intervention, even where resources are limited, and for sorting according to capacity to benefit. The problem with this is that age is at best a very rough guide to prognosis. It's the diseases and impairments that commonly accompany old age which affect the decline in average outcomes from some medical interventions, not age itself. Individuals vary, vary enormously in their rate of aging, <coughs> and it would seem more logical to use the particular relevant physiological impairments as the clinical basis for rationing rather than the surrogate of age. All over the world, healthcare systems are said to be in financial crisis, and people are searching for ways to contain costs and distribute resources better. Hence the economic case for age rationing. Some health economists and utilitarian philosophers have suggested that the gain from treating the elderly is insufficient to warrant the cost. Other uses of those resources would be more efficient. The claim is commonly associated with the influential National Institute for Health and Clinical Excellence. Despite its acronym NICE. This institute engages in not so nice cost benefit and quality, quality adjusted life years analysis that many conclude is irreparably ageist. These utilitarian approaches are also associated with a view that a at a certain point patients are better off dead. Are better off dead and that care should be reduced to zero as they approach that point. Thus, qualiists would in principle defund all terminal care. Some have even argued that society should divert other resources, not just medical ones, from older, less productive members to younger, more productive ones. In an attempt to discredit the Hippocratic Christian alternative, NICE has dismissed needs-based allocation as paternalistic, ineffective, and even Marxist. The father of health economics, Alan Williams, favoured weighing qualities against the elderly because they'd already had a fair innings. In his most recent work, the doyen of age rationing, Daniel Callahan, has shifted towards the NICE proposal that qualities be used for all age groups and then the elderly sifted out. Thus, like Williams, he'd refuse expensive treatments with low quality yield to all patients. But even cheaper, 
and high quality yielding ones to older patients. Callaghan also now supports withdrawal of basic care from demented, non-responsive patients. Well, elsewhere I've examined the utilitarian underpinnings and troublesome conclusions of such approaches, as have many others. Suffice it here to say that quality of life is a highly contentious concept. It attempts to apply it to healthcare rationing are dogged with theoretical and practical problems. No very coherent account of benefit is usually offered. No valid basis for measuring and comparing choices or policies. And attempts to produce action guides are fraught with further difficulties. It's logically impossible to judge if an allocation process is efficient while eschewing an account of the human good, moral reason, community and the purposes of healthcare. Health economists may simply be showing us how to get most efficiently to the wrong place. In the process, we may be led to compromise basic moral principles against killing, harming and abandoning and favouring respect for the elderly, for the dignity and equality of all, promotion of health and support for the disadvantaged. While most people are troubled by pragmatic and economic rationalist approaches that would seriously reduce treatment for the elderly or exclude them altogether from treatment, there is some intuitive appeal to age-based rationing. If you've got one intensive care bed or one heart for transplant and two patients that need it, one young and one old, many people think that Sacris Paribus, the younger person, should get it. The best known ethical cases for this were first elaborated in the 1980s by Daniel Callahan in Setting Limits, Medical Goals in an Aging Society and Norman Daniels, Am I My Parents Keeper? An essay on justice between the young and the old. Both began with the notion of the fair innings. So in Americans, they didn't use those words. They called it the natural lifespan as Callahan put it, a life long enough to experience those opportunities that life typically affords people and which we ordinarily take to be the prime benefits of life. Soon after those books were published, Pete Townsend spoke again for the spirit of the age when he was asked by an interviewer whether he still hoped to die before he got old. Well, now he was 20 years older. He said yes. But by this he meant he hoped to live long enough to accomplish everything he wanted and short enough to be finished in life before he'd run out of things to achieve. A fair innings is then about opportunities. But when is enough life enough? For individuals to seek more than a fair innings, especially at the expense of other important goods, can represent a lack of prudence or proportion about lifespan lack of fortitude in the face of sickness and death, and a kind of medical intemperance. St Basil the Great counselled Christians to avoid whatever requires such undue thought or effort or expenditure as to make our whole life revolve around solicitude for the flesh. Callaghan says, accepting personal responsibility includes coming to terms with the inevitability of ageing and death and not imagining one is exempt from the change and decay all around us see. Different temperaments, commitments and life plans mean people differ in the priority they give to the pursuit of life and health. But there comes a point when seeking more may be vain, in vain, or require irrational expense. Daniels and Callaghan argue their case more on the basis of justice than temperance, fortitude, or prudence. Expecting others to foot the bill for one's aspiration to endless earthly life and health represents, they argue, an unreasonable preference for self and disregard for others and the common good. Good healthcare systems try to give everyone a good chance of a reasonable length of life in reasonable health. But faced with competing demands, they must taper off provision to those who have already had this in favour of those who have not. 
Earlier this year, Callahan claimed the elderly are now a hazard to the young because of their voracious appetite for healthcare, consuming far more than their just share. A good society ought to help young people become old people, he said, but is under no obligation to help old people become indefinitely older. <coughs> Daniels and Callahan have also argued that most people would prefer their life's healthcare entitlements skewed towards their younger years and that the system should reflect this. Similarly, Leonard Fleck has argued in his series on just caring that as rationing is inescapable, it should be done in a visible and consultative way. And he claims that prudent, risk averse people behind the Rawlsian veil of ignorance would favour younger patients for life prolonging prolonging treatments, and older patients for palliative ones. Ezekiel Emanuel and colleagues have likewise proposed a complete lives principle for distributing health resources, arguing that age rationing maximises the chances of everyone experiencing all stages of the life cycle. Older patients have less priority for life prolonging treatments, such as kidney transplants, because they've already enjoyed a more or less complete life. All these fair innings writers approach their subject from a liberal egalitarian perspective and make a much more morally robust case for age rationing than those based on purely clinical, financial or utilitarian considerations. Their version of age rationing is not unjustly discriminatory in the way that distributing according to race, sexuality or religious beliefs would be, because all people are subject to ageing and would be entitled to the same care over a lifetime. There's no denial of equal access or opportunity across the life cycle. Whether these fair innings approaches are nonetheless unjustly discriminatory is a matter to which I'll return. An argument for some rationing might also be made on the basis of the ends internal to health care. Rather than seeking the indefinite extension of life and health, health care properly has the humbler and more attainable goal of maintaining or raising health and extending life to species typical level. Attempts to achieve super health or endless earthly life are not the province of health care. Fair innings theorists insist that age rationing should not mean abandoning the elderly. Any exclusions would need to be publicly defensible, applied consistently but gently and with a heavy heart, and represent no diminishment of respect. The elderly would still be entitled to a primary to primary health care, good pain relief, institutional nursing, hospices, and so on. Such age rationing, they assert, would alleviate rather than heighten intergenerational rivalry, and will <coughs> This will be necessary if the elderly are to receive any care at all in the future. Well, let me now offer some arguments against age rationing, ones that I believe are persuasive. One, what length of life might one reasonably expect and what health opportunities up till then? Callahan and Daniels talk of a typical lifespan but that depends very much on socioeconomic circumstances and current technologies. In many times and places, few people have achieved 80 years or even half that. Is it unreasonable for someone in Swaziland to aspire to more than the 31.9 years typically afforded in that region today? Are we to regard improvements in life expectancy in, pl in such places as a failure of respect for nature or a kind of intemperance? Surely we are right to rejoice that more people now attain a longer period of old age in better average health than was common in the past, and so have the opportunity to enjoy that phase of their life with the relationships and activities proper to it. Two, the rescue imperative of traditional Hippocratic and Judeo-Christian Judeo -Christian medicine has been very fruitful not just in assisting particular patients, but also in advancing medicine itself. Gerontology and healthcare more generally would little improve if we systematically abandoned the attempt to extend the life or improve the health of the elderly. 
Three, even if there comes a point where many people feel that they've had a fair innings and would not feel robbed with their life soon to end, others will want a longer life. They may simply value life and health more, or they may wish to achieve some other reasonable end, such as finish their magnum opus, care for their dependent spouse, or redress some past error, none of which need reflect a shortfall in rationality or virtue. Or, fair innings writers may be right to claim that many people would willingly forego care in their old age, so that more might be available to themselves or others when young. But we cannot generalise this to everyone. Joseph Boyle observes that we cannot morally leap from considerations which motivate some elderly people to volunteer to decline some health care to the conclusion that this might be imposed on all. Five. It's by no means clear that prudence would counsel skewing health care entitlements towards one's early years. Whatever theorists, patients, own children or health workers think, many older people do in fact want complex care, such as resuscitation. What older people judge as adequate quality of life is also different. A 2007 study in nursing ethics found that people over 60 feared younger people categorising them as old, because this means low priority for healthcare. Even if people behind the veil of ignorance would prefer age rationing, which is debatable, those who actually suffer the burden of such a policy are better placed, placed to assess its reasonableness. Six, Samuel Kirstein and Greg Bonya have recently observed that fair innings theorists focus on how well or badly one's life goes as a whole, and not on how one fares at any particular time. But don't most of us think that alleviating pain, for instance, has a moral urgency not satisfied by being told you've already had a good life overall? Seven. Fair innings accounts also seem to presume that the fairest way to allocate health care is more or less evenly to people rather than disproportionately to the elderly. But spreading limited resources evenly is not always the fairest way to distribute them. Every parent understands that larger and older children will need more food. Every doctor understands that sicker people will need more health care. If health care is intended for the sick, as such, then prima facie, the just way to allocate it will be to the sick, and first to the sickest. No wonder then that the elderly receive much of this attention. No one complains that children chew up a big share of education resources, <laughs> because that's precisely who they're for. Eight. The doctor-patient relationship would be radically affected by appointing health carers to assess when patients have had their fair share of lifespan or health opportunities. Age rationing tends to homogenise the elderly in the eyes of carers as a demographic, rather than several individuals. Indeed, as a swarm of voracious but unworthy consumers of a resource which doctors must, must guard from them. Nine. The elderly are the ones who on average have made the greatest contribution to the health taxpayers as well as many other areas of society, in the reasonable expectation that their health care needs will be accommodated in due course. To deny them health care could amount to unjust enrichment, even theft, by the young. 10. Even if one accepts a case for some age rationing, decisions will have to be made about whether this is to be a gradual tapering off of services or an on-off switch applied at a certain age, year 65, and whether this will be irrespective of clinical considerations, and whether there will be any exceptions and on what basis. These judgments import a range of considerations that must themselves be argued for, probably independently of the case based on age. 11. Both direct and indirect age rationing is probably illegal in countries such as the UK. I could say more about it, but I'm, that, but I'm nearly out of time. 12. Age rationing will not relieve indefinitely the problem of escalating demands and costs of healthcare systems. 
which group will be next for exclusion once those savings have been exhausted? Those with handicaps? Or those whose social contributions are deemed to be low? And finally, 13, aid rationing goes against the ideals of valuing all people as of equal dignity and addressing equal needs equally that informs most welfare policy as well as Hippocratic medicine. Contemporary Western societies already demonstrate ageist prejudice and abandonment of the elderly in many contexts. To take away much of health care, one of the last examples of care supposedly offered to all, could reflect and would generate further bias against this already vulnerable group. Those who live too long could be seen as burdens. Sensitivity to their needs would be dull. As the costs of health care generally, and the care of the elderly in particular, continue to rise, there'll be a pressure to scapegoat, abandon, even kill the elderly as a cost-cutting measure. We should resist that pressure now by a strong insistence that age will not be a criterion of health care distribution. Which brings me, in conclusion, to the covenant between the generations. I've argued that age rationing is not the way to resolve resourcing and distribution problems in healthcare. Better ways must begin with a substantive conception of the human person, of the place of life and health in a human story, and what is needed to promote those goods, of personal responsibility for health and healthcare, of the traditions, norms and virtues appropriate to that practice, of the responsibilities of all societies and the capacities and goals of our particular one, and of the scope and limits of the right to health care. From such a rich account of what health care is about, we may conclude that patients, <laughs> health workers and services should give priority to people's most important needs over less important ones, and to those with more important needs over those with less important ones. Age rationing on this account is unjustly discriminatory and socially dangerous. But the distribution of healthcare is not just about justice, narrowly construed. Healthcare systems also tell a story of the kind of people we are and wish to be. The inclusion or not of the elderly and on what terms reveals attitudes to ageing and the elderly themselves and levels of filial affection and duty, veneration of elders and gratitude for their contribution. Their inclusion in the community of those served on the basis of need demonstrates how much we value life and health, but also how much we value persons, frail, vulnerable, sick or suffering persons of whatever age. To embrace age rationing of healthcare would be to tell a very different story. If healthcare is a narrative, Christians hope to retell by such care the story of the Good Samaritan. This is a tale of neighbourly compassion and generosity of Christ the position of bodies and souls responding to crying need. The Good Samaritan doesn't first assess whether the man beaten and left for dead has already had a typical lifespan or opportunity range, or do a quality and cost-benefit analysis before deciding whether to invest. We're not told if the victim in that story was young or old, because it's irrelevant to this corporal work of mercy. The Good Samaritan and his charge were strangers to each other. Generations should not be. Norman Daniels, the uh, proponent of age rationing, says children have few or no filial obligations because they had no choice in coming to be. The duties are all at the parents' end. Callaghan has a more mutual view, acknowledging that all of us are subject to the common threat of illness, age and death. This is a powerful bond to draw us together the young and the old need each other to cope with and mutually bear the economical and social burden of our shared fate. But what does it mean to bear this shared fate mutually? In Evangelium Vitae, John Paul II wrote of the intolerable neglect that some of the elderly, handicapped and dying experience, even perhaps especially in affluent countries. He exhorted us to preserve or re-establish where it's been lost, a sort of covenant between the generations, a relationship of acceptance, solidarity, closeness and service. 
The elderly are not a problem, a market, in due course, ourselves. We are formed, not to keep from them. Of course, we need principles of fairness here and virtues like medical temperance. But to wish we were dead, but for the sudden us, is no anthem for a good society. I guess I won't see the next London Olympics, but I wonder if it will celebrate the NHS as this one did. I hope it will have cause to. And I hope that healthcare in this country will have played its part in ensuring that the children bouncing on the beds at this year's Olympics have achieved a ripe old age that permits them to see the next London Games. Thank you. Yes, I, I, we, we do ration, uh, inevitably, because there's no way that we are going to have uh, the, the supply to satisfy the demand. So we have to think, well, how do we do it? How do we best do it? And I proposed here, and more fully elsewhere, that it should be on strictly on the basis of need, with, with perhaps certain other groups like the seriously disadvantaged getting some extra help. Uh, and I've tried to articulate what that would mean in terms of the various kinds of urgency of need or, or greatness of need. And I think that focus can take us a long way to working out a principled way of rationing healthcare resources that doesn't end up picking on particular groups as the people we're going to exclude. seems to be kind of mostly relevant to a sort of socialised healthcare system. Do you think there's any different arguments or considerations that come into play in a healthcare system like the US, where it's much more private based? Uh, I think that clearly some, some other arguments have to be uh, contended with, in particular whether ability to pay should be the principal basis on which we allocate healthcare, which in a free market system it might be. Or it might be the, simply the provider's choice of who they want to, to give it to. So again, a free market would give us at least two other criteria we certainly have to analyse, and I'd make a case against both of those being uh, good criteria on which to, to allocate healthcare. In which case, in a, in a more free market system or a mixed system, because the United States system is quite a mixed one, there's, there's a huge resource, for instance, being put into the care of the elderly. In, in the United States, uh, at least until Obamacare, and supposedly that's going to be extended further to, to more groups. We'll see. Uh, it means that the, the, the communities as a whole, including the governments, but not only the governments, also the Dominion organisations, churches, church hospitals, charities, between them, they have to find a way that ensures that the, the free market element it is not does not result in only those who can pay or uh, those whom the doctors like uh, or considerations like that determining who gets the care, but that in the end, again, is still in, in effect being rational according to need.
Um, are there reasons, for instance, for excluding assisted reproduction for women in, or, and men in their seventies? Yes, I, I think there are reasons. Um, <laughs> and essentially the reasons are that you're not engaging in medicine when you're doing that. You're engaging in some other social project. Uh, and if you, if there's some argument, I don't think there is, for why that's a socially valuable thing to do, or do it somewhere else, but don't call it healthcare. It's not healthcare to make 90-year-olds pregnant. It's actually doing something quite perverse to 90-year-olds. Uh, and, and I think we need a, a sense of, of the scope and also limits of the medical art and what it's for. of this year in the context of the Olympic Games, our present Secretary of State for Health said that the disabled should be valued for their contribution. I, I was amazed that I saw no comment on this rather Hitlerian remark uh, in anywhere in the media. Um, mm. Would you like to comment, please? Interesting. I, I proposed there towards the end that even if you did get way a community to exclude the elderly largely from healthcare, those savings would not be enough ultimately. You're going to have to look for another group. And who will you target next? And I think very likely it'll be a group like those living with handicaps, one kind or another. Again, arguably that's already going on in all sorts of ways. In all sorts of ways, they, there's an indirect discrimination because we know they don't receive uh, various kinds of healthcare that they're condition of war, whether that's because of difficulty of access or for all sorts of reasons. So I think it's it, it, it's quite right for you to raise the issue. I, I, I began with attitudes to the elderly, to elderliness. You could make a similar range of, of, of propositions, I think, about our attitudes to disability and to the disabled or people living with disabilities and what that will mean what it already means, could mean for ration in healthcare. I think we have to be equally vigilant uh, with that particular group. Thank you. Now I'm going to have a word from Professor Jones, but please join me in thanking Bishop Anthony for his very clear
Thank you. 